and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we are here for the leadership discussion forum um, on real world significance um, beyond p-value. This event is hosted by Da Shu, which is a nonprofit organization um, promoting research and education in data science. This event is also co-sponsored by San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the American Statistical Association, SFASA. My name is Rishao Liu. I am affiliated with both organizations. I'm a co-founder for Dashu and I'm also a past president for SFASA. And I also work here at Genomic Health, which has kindly provided IT support, infrastructure support, and also venue for us to have today's event. So it's really great to see everyone here um, for a topic that is vital to statistical profession as well as scientific community at large. And we have a pretty packed agenda today. We're gonna start by um, brief introduction of the two nonprofit organizations and also um, followed by introduction to the, of the panelist and we'll have the panel discussion with the four speakers um, and wrap up with the floor a discussion and hopefully we can finish up around 6.30. With that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Jing Huang to introduce um, Da Shu. Okay, so I'm the founding president of Dashu. Dashu is a very young organization, it's about four years old, and we collaborate with SFASA a lot. And uh, I'm also, I have served in SFASA for many years. I'm currently the chapter representative. Um, so we are a formal 501c3 nonprofit organization and uh, we have a member about 2000 people and the membership is free and almost all the event you um, enjoy and participate in Dashu is free. Uh, and all of us, myself, Rachel, and many talented and passionate volunteers, we all work um, free. So there is almost no administrative cost. Even our CPA work for free. So the cost, I think, is just the filing fee to IRS is <laughs> administrative cost. And uh, the goal of Da Shu, I think, um, Da Shu in Chinese is a Chinese pun. It both means big data and also means big tree. And in China, we say this generation plant a tree so the whole village can enjoy the shade. So we are thinking about the same thing. We're trying to provide a virtual community for people in data science, statistics. They can exchange ideas, support each other, and share cutting edge research. So we organize many things, international conferences, uh, monthly journal club, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Event like today, a leadership panel discussion on p-value, a very important topic. And we're actively seeking members, volunteers, ideas, and money, right? I will not be shy about it because everything is free, but someone needs to run stuff and provide all those event and infrastructure. So we do need money. So if you're interested in sponsoring or donation, do let me know. So just a highlight of things we did in the last half year. So this is the BBSW, the Bay Area Biotech Pharmaceutical Pharmaceutical Workshop that was in November last year. And um, you probably see many familiar faces also in today's audience. It was such a great pleasure to be able to host such an important conference. It's two days and it's more than 200 people joined and it was in Foster City. I think it's, uh, it really met an unmet need for the local statisticians in industry sectors to get together and share their ideas and discuss you know, important topics. Then soon after that, we worked with SFASA and celebrated the 90th birthday. So we were a very proud sponsor of that event and many of us served there too. So it's like our second home. So that was a stellar panelist and with keynote from Brad Efron and Michael Jordan. It's a very memorable event. That was last December. And then 
this is what this was the one we also co-sponsored this is not even in bay area so remember dashu is a virtual community while most of office most of the officers are in bay area we are actually virtual right you can join us whenever you so this is in connecticut and this is staff for Unc. I think actually the idea initiated from one of our funding officer in Lu from Stanford, and we were a sponsor and we helped with many of the logistics and broadcasting. And quite a few of the officers are there participating in this wonderful event. And you can see, and I think that the re we are so proud to be in that symposium. I think that's the best perfect example of synergy working cross-functionally. MD, regulator, statistician work together to get provide the best product to the patient's hand in the most efficient manner. So that's that. And then that this was last weekend. So we had a leadership panel discussion uh, in Boston on Harvard campus. So I was there. Uh, I just fly back uh, two days ago. So we are also starting our East Coast chapter doing more local event. And almost all of this um, are provide, you know, are, are shared with our members whenever they're in, whatever their interest may be. Uh, beyond those uh, local on-site event, I think another very steady, fast kind of effort is our monthly virtual journal club. So we pick the speaker, usually very high quality, many of them ASA fellows, as well as, you know, physicians or basic scientists when they publish exciting um, research in science, nature, cell, you name it, then we invite them to come give a talk. So you, if you go to our website, and you will see that logo of a blue book, click on that. The beauty is, as long as the speaker agree, we catalog that, videotape that, the slides, the videotaping are all there, archived, more than 20 of them, and you can enjoy anytime you want. And it's all free, there's no string attached, no password, just click, and you can go through all the old archive journal club and you can enjoy it. But again, I want to say, we are actively seeking sponsors. If you're interested, just email us because um, the infrastructure and all that do cost money. And this is all provided to you all, to the community for free. And this is our uh, June topic. So this, you know, stay tuned. And if you say, hey, I don't know how I can get in, just email to that address. I will show that again. You can take a picture. So June will be presented by ASA fellow, Dr. Jo Joseph Capillary, and many of them, you probably know him. And he is going to talk about meta-analysis for decision-making. Um, it will be on our website too, and if you become our member, you will get our email announcement uh, about those events, how to register, and all that. So again, we welcome you to become a member. A membership is free, no string attached. You can come, you can go anytime. Everything, you know, the events are free too. So you will receive email announcement if you want to join, or if your friends want to join, you can scan that, you know, 2D code, or you can just email us after this event to say, hey, I want to join, to add my name into it. We are also, because as I mentioned, all of us have daytime job. Bay Area housing is really too expensive. <laughs> Without daytime job, we cannot pay the mortgage. So we do it in our free time. That said, we need a lot of passionate volunteers to help the cause, to work together to organize more meaningful events. So we're also actively seeking passionate volunteer. I think that would be a great opportunity to network, to sharpen your person's soft skills, right? Serve the community, expand, you know, exposed to cutting edge research. If you're interested, same thing, email to that address. That's it. And now I'm going to hand in to Ron to talk about SFASA. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, my name is Ron Yu. I'm the president-elect of SFASA. So the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the ASA was uh, chartered more than 90 years ago on June 29th, 1928, uh, making it the fourth oldest chapter in the nation. Um, besides having a long history and uh, tradition, uh, the Bay Area local chapter is also one of the largest chapters in the nation. We have several hundred members 
who apply statistics in a wide variety of areas and uh, applications. Uh, this slide shows you some of the activities that we have organized. Um, we organized technical seminars. We have organized more than 60 seminars since 2010. We also organized symposium and short courses. Uh, last summer, we had Dr. David uh, Mar Marotra of Merck uh, Research Laboratories who visited San Francisco and gave a short course on uh, randomized clinical trials, uh, replacing traditional analysis with better alternatives. This year, uh, we're very lucky that we're gonna have Professor Rebecca, of, Rebecca Hubbard of University of Pennsylvania uh, to visit San Francisco and give a short course on analysis of big healthcare databases. The date of the short course will be Wednesday, November 6th. The location is yet to be decided, so please stay tuned. Um, since 2015, uh, we have held uh, career development panel discussions, which is led by a group of distinguished panelists from both academia and industry towards the end of each year, uh, as Jean had already mentioned. Um, and this has become one of our newest traditions. Last year, the career development panel discussion was combined with the 90th anniversary celebration, as Jean had also mentioned. <laughs> Uh, because last year was the 90th birthday for the local chapter. And Professor Bradley Afron of Stanford University and Professor Michael Jordan of UC Berkeley were the keynote speakers at the event. It was a well attended event with more than 200 members uh, coming to the celebration. Uh, a short description of our event was published in the March issue of this year's Amstad News. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about it. Uh, we also support our local students. Each year we provide travel assistance up to $1,000 per student to graduate students who will present their work at the JSM. Uh, this year we have six winners of the Student Travel Award who will present, uh, who will give a preview of what they will present at the JSM on June 5th at San Francisco State University. Uh, everyone is welcome to come to the presentations to support our students. Also, over the past uh, 10 years or so, we have been visiting local high schools to give a lecture on careers in statistics to AP statistics students after they've taken their AP statistics exam. Um, lastly, we also co-sponsor conferences and events uh, with other organizations, such as today's event with Dashu, uh, which was one of our favorite uh, collaborators. Uh, finally, I would just like to thank all of our officers and volunteers for making things possible. Uh, as you can see, all of us uh, have regular daytime jobs, but I was constantly amazed by the amount of energy and effort that everyone is willing to put in in their spare time to support the local statistics community. Uh, so if you are local in the Bay Area and uh, are interested in helping out with the local chapter, please join us. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Jing and Rong, um, the one for introduction of the two nonprofit organizations. And you guys heard their plea, so please, um, you know, join us together and because this is really a community that we are building together. So why, why we are here today? Um, I think most of you um, is aware um, that in earlier this year, a special issue paper were pub was published on the American Statistician, so that's the ASA journal, um, with the title, Moving to a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. And at the same time, I think on the same day, Nature published articles on teaching statistical significance in the title. So quite eye-catching. And this is actually not new. This is a follow-up um, development following the previous articles on science, scientific research reproducibility crisis, and also 2016 ASA has a statement on p-value. But this time, the, in the ASA special issue paper, the authors calls to stop using the term statistically significant. 
And since then, I have had a lot of interesting discussions with my colleagues, um, my statistician colleagues and non-statistical um, colleagues. Um, and actually, I'm really interested to know what the audience think about two things. So by a show of hands, do you think we should abandon p-value? Yes. By a show of hands. All right. Okay, we got one, one here and uh, another one in the back. Okay, great. Uh, what if, uh, do you think we should not? We should not abandon p-value. All right, we got like about two thirds of them. Interesting. Um, should we stop using the term statistical significance? Saying yes by a show of hands. I, I saw one, two, all right. Um, who think we should not stop using it? We got about half of the room here. Um, sorry for the online folks, but um, it's very interesting because um, this is actually very consistent with uh, my discussion, my observations. Um, not by saying the, you know, which one is majority, but um, there's just a very wide range of opinions on this topic. I think mostly because everyone has a different working environment. We talk to colleagues who are not statisticians and they have different trainings. We deal with um, different regulatory frameworks. Some of us working in a more exploratory and more research um, type of setting and, you know, chasing after p-value is very concerning. But some of us working in pharmaceutical or biotech industry, we're in a confirmatory trial controlling the type 1 error makes sense and was considered and has been considered appropriate use. So that's the very wide range of the opinion and also experiences of each one of us have been experienced. And I think I'm going to paraphrase um, our current ASA president, Karen's uh, writing in her presidential column at, in the American um, Amstead News, which is, if, any, if anything, um, all the controversial versi about p-value and statistical significance just means there's a lot of work to do for our statisticians. And we are needed more than ever to bring or articulate, better communicate the notion of uncertainty to scientists, to engineers, to community at large, to bring clarity to complex issues and guide the team for a data-driven and evidence-based decision-making. So, because we all know that magic certainty button just never exists. But luckily, today we have four prominent panelists that can share their experiences, share their opinions, and maybe also share their you know, tips in practicing statistics on this topic. We got Dr. Ron Watterstein from American Statistical Association. He's the executive director at ASA and also the official spokesman, spokesperson. And Ron also graciously agreed to participate this panel in person. He just flew in this morning and is going to take another red wife flight back to the DC area later tonight. So I really appreciate that, Ron. And we, the second speaker is Dr. Sid Goodman from Stanford. The third one is Dr. Wedi Wong from Theravis uh, Biopharma. And we're going to finish by um, Dr. Imola Fodor from Genentech Roche. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Ron Wasserstein um, for his remark. That's great, thanks. Very good. 
so my um, children will get after me if I don't mention, um, show that uh, that being in the Buzz Lightyear conference room, they felt like we missed an opportunity by uh, not titling this session the real world significance to infinity and beyond p-value. <laughs> so I have to, I had to be sure to mention that or they would have been unhappy with me. So I'm going to um, read from prepared remarks so that I'm sure that I get in um, everything that I wanted to say within 15 minutes because there is, I should warn the rest of you uh, speakers, right down here there is a, an injection thing that happens apparently in, uh, no, I'm just kidding. There's, you looked, right. 38 months ago, in March 2016, the American Statistical Association published its statement on p-values and statistical significance. Two months ago today, the American statistician published a special issue on statistical inference, co-edited by Alan Sherm, Nicole Lazar, and me, which included an editorial entitled, Moving to a World Beyond P Less Than 0.05. In the 15 minutes allotted to me, I'd like to set the stage for today's discussion by telling you why the ASA statement and the special issue came into existence, summarize what they say, and perhaps clarify what they do not say as well. The ASA isn't really in the business of making statements about matters of statistical and scientific practice. And yet we did in this case. Why? For three basic reasons. First, the problems with p-values, well, to be perfectly clear, the problems with the understanding and use of null hypothesis significance testing have been well documented and complained about for many decades. Let's look at two quick quotes. It has been widely felt, probably for 30 years and more, that significance tests are overemphasized and often misused, and that more emphasis should be put on estimation and prediction. Researchers pay undue attention to the results of tests of significance they perform on their data, particularly data derived from experiments, and too little to the estimates of the magnitude of the effects which they are investigating. The emphasis on tests of significance and the consideration of the results of each experiment in isolation have had the unfortunate consequence that researchers have often regarded the execution of a test of significance on an experiment as the ultimate objective. Results are significant or not, and that is the end of it. Now let's look at the attributions and dates on these quotes. The first one was from David Cox in 1986, referring back to at least 1956, which I'll own up to as being the year of my birth. And the one before that is from Frank Yates, writing about the book in which, in 1951, writing about the book in which Fisher introduced the concept of p-values to the wider statistical community. For reasons like these, uh, Nicole and I wrote these words in our introduction to the ASA statement. Let us be clear, nothing in the ASA statement is new. Statisticians and others have been sounding the alarm about these matters for decades to little avail. We hoped that a statement from the world's largest professional association of statisticians would open a fresh discussion and draw renewed and vigorous attention to changing the practice of science with regards to the use of statistical inference. So the first reason for the ASA statement is that the problem had been identified for a long time really much longer even than identified in these quotes. Second, statistics was shouldering some of the blame for the rise of the so-called reproducibility crisis. That is, that the results of certain research is not able to be repeated in further research. Now this is a nuanced problem about which I'll say a little bit more in a few minutes. And third, this blame on statistics was making it into the science press. We saw articles like this one. Odds are it's wrong. Science fails to face the shortcomings of statistics. That article in Science News referred to statistics as a mutant form of math and offered some strong criticisms as well. 
I tell you, when I see things like that, I get a little p-valued off, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> Significance testing is ubiquitous in science. Here's a quote from a 1991 paper in Statistical Science by the estimable Chris Chatfield. Most statisticians are all too familiar with conversations with start, what is the purpose of your analysis? I, I want to do a significance test. Well, no, I mean, what is the overall objective? I, I want to know if my results are significant. I want now to take a quick moment to emphasize how the p-value statement was developed. The statement was the result of intense discussions over nearly two, year, two years by a panel of experts. The six principles in the statement represent the extent to which these people, in their diversity of judgment, could come to agreement at that time. It is not a matter of voting. It's a it was a, a reaching of consensus among these experts. Their consensus was endorsed by the ASA Board of Directors, which reflects not only an endorsement of the outcome, but of the process as well. The ASA statement has been viewed over 315,000 times and cited over 1,870 times. During the past six months, it has been cited over 18 times a week. I will quickly highlight the most relevant aspects of that statement for today's discussion. Here, for example, is principle number three. Scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. And here are some of the things that the panel said about this principle. Practices that reduce data analysis or scientific inference to mechanical bright line rules, such as P less than 0.05, for justifying scientific claims or conclusions can lead to erroneous beliefs and poor decision making. Researchers should bring many contextual factors into play to derive scientific inferences, including the design of the study, the quality of the measurements, the external evidence for the phenomenon under study, and the validity of assumptions that underlie the data analysis. The widespread use of statistical significance, generally interpreted as P less than 0.05, as a license for making a claim of scientific finding or implied truth, leads to a considerable distortion of the scientific process. Principle four. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. Researchers should disclose the number of hypotheses explored during the study, all data collection decisions, all statistical analyses conducted, and all p-values computed. Valid scientific conclusions based on p-values and related statistics cannot be drawn without at least knowing how many and which analyses were conducted and how those analyses, including p-values, were selected for reporting. You might be saying, well, yeah, sure. And yet how many times do you see this actually done? A p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. Statistical significance is not equivalent to scientific, human, or economic significance. Smaller p-values do not necessarily imply the presence of larger or more important effects and larger p-values do not imply a lack of importance or even lack of effect. By itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. And the conclusion of the p-value statement, good statistical practice as an essential component of good scientific practice emphasizes principles of good study design and conduct a variety of numerical and graphical summaries of data, understanding of the phenomenon under study, interpretation of results in context, complete reporting, and proper logical and quantitative understanding of what data summaries mean. No single in index should substitute for scientific reasoning. Because the ASA statement gave a lot of advice about what not to do, we set out to provide researchers with advice about what to do. In October of 2017, we held the Symposium on Statistical Inference with these lofty goals. Drive change on the matters raised in the ASA statement. 
providing necessary impetus for lasting improvements in science and society, in the teaching of statistics, statistical practice, and the dissemination and many uses of statistical results. Those are lofty goals. So while we were at it, we wanted to solve the problems on the Korean Peninsula, slow the pace of global warming, and make a Nickelback record go platinum. Alas, certain results, certain problems remain intractable. Following three days of great presentations at the symposium, we opened the discussions to the world. We issued a call for papers for the American statistician, open not only to symposium presenters, but to everyone. The key is that we wanted people to write for the non-statistical audience, and we wanted to be able to give that audience advice about how to move beyond P less than 0.05, the do's, not the don'ts. Ultimately, we received about 100 papers and, in, and ended up publishing 43 of them, the equivalent of three regular issues of the American Statistician. We were able to do this because of a fantastic set of associate editors, and of course, because of a large group of anonymous reviewers. Now, please note the difference between the ASA statement, oh, what? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know how that got up there, sorry. Now, now, please note the difference between the ASA statement and this special issue of our editorial as illustrated in this slide. The ASA statement is the consensus of a panel of experts. The special issue is a set of peer-reviewed articles accompanied by an editorial. These are opinions and professional judgments. They are opinions which appear to reflect the reviews of many in the profession at this time, but they do not reflect a consensus, nor are they the professional judgment of the board of directors of the American Statistical Association. The recommendation of the editors of the special issue and of many of the authors of the, of the special issue is that it is time to stop using statistical significance. This is a step, an important step, beyond what the ASA p-value statement said. Why did we argue this step should be taken? Essentially, for four reasons. First, that significance, as it was originally intended, has long ago lost its real meaning. Second, that bright line rules have led to all the well-known problems of cherry picking, p-hacking, harking, and so on. As noted in the p-value statement, bright line rules for decision-making have been bad for science. This false dichotomy that splits results into worthy and unworthy has led to selective reporting of results, the file drawer problem. And finally, decades of complaining about the problem have not led to change. Half measures haven't worked. Two weeks ago today, the National Academies released its report on reproducibility and rep replicability in science. In its summary, the report distinguishes between reproducibility, replicability, and generalizability. It talks broadly about its recommendations and it specifically singles out statistical inference, acknowledging that inappropriate reliance on statistical significance can lead to biases in research reporting and publication. The executive summary says that researchers should take care to estimate and explain the uncertainty inherent in their results, to make proper use of statistical methods and to describe their methods and data in a clear, accurate, and complete way. During the Q&A portion of this session, perhaps I'll have time to say a bit more about how the editorial and the special issue spells out ways to move to a world beyond statistical significance. But that National Academy's recommendation on your screen is extremely important. Our recommendation to say goodbye to statistical significance does not lessen the importance of statistics. It does not say to stop using p-values. Rather, it forces the user of statistical methods to let go of the simple but not justifiable reliance on bright line thresholds and to focus more broadly on the data and on the science. Embrace statistics, but abandon statistical <laughs> significance. That's our message. Thanks.
on helping the practicing statisticians um, to better, you know, communicate or articulate, um, you know, the uncertainty, the notion of uncertainty? So, um, there is one thing we're doing, uh, uh, and I had slides for that because Rochelle uh, warned me that I would be asked this question. So I'm very excited to announce that we have created a position with this title, Senior Advisor for Statistics Communication and Media Innovation. Um, this individual will uh, help us improve the ways that we are, communicate statistics directly with the public, improve our communication of statistics policy issues. The ASA is very active in, uh, in its work in, in, in policy, bring more statistics to journalists and journalism, and, and do a better job of enhancing public engagement uh, and communication skills for, for statisticians and people training to be statistics students. Um, I'll give some quick examples here. We want to uh, develop and promote our own timely lang uh, lay language content for the public about statistics and about what statisticians do. We want to develop a media strategy for every policy issue that we're working on so we can more effectively communicate um, the things that we are doing uh, to um, in, in the areas of, of policy. For example, um, we're very active on the issue of the, uh, the insertion of the, the uh, citizenship question into the, um, the, into the census. Um, we want to develop research, uh, uh, more resources for journalists and other professional uh, communicators. And we want to develop training materials for, for um, students and professionals in statistics and data science to make them more effective in communicating uncertainty. And so we have hired an amazing individual to do this. Regina Nutso is, is, uh, is a unicorn. She is a PhD in statistics from uh, a local university here, uh, Stanford. Um, she uh, is also professionally trained as a as a communicator. She has a graduate certificate in science communication. She is currently a faculty member at Gallaudet University in Washington, DC, but in about three weeks, she'll be coming to work for the ASA. And soon after that, we'll be announcing a, a joint appointment that she will have at, at a university in the, um, in the DC area, working to improve statistics communication, but also working to train uh, journalists and statistics students as well. So super excited about that. And thanks for letting me announce that here. Thank you so much, Ron. And now let's welcome Dr. Steve Goodman, um, our second panelist. Um, Steve, Dr. Steve Goodman is Associate Dean of Clinical and Translational Research and Professor of Medicine and of Epidemiology, directing Stanford's CTSA Spectrum Training Programs in Medical Research Methods and serving as Chief of the Division of Epidemiology in um, HRP. He's co-founder and co-director of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford as well. So please, Steve. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to give my talk with Regina's picture there, but uh, I'll wait for my own slides. <laughs> She's, oh, which button, okay. Oh, there we go, okay. Thank you. Maybe I should put Regina back up, actually. <laughs> um, so this has this very ungainly title. Uh, really what the title of this is, and, and the title I've used for talks like this is, How Do We Get the Uncertainty Right? Which is really what statistics is all about. And I'm gonna uh, reflect a bit on why this has been so intractable. I, I first got the, involved in this whole area when I was a graduate student in the 80s, and I was inspired by an article I read in 1982 called Statistical Trials and uh, uh, Clinical Trials and Statistical Verdicts that was in the Annals of Internal Medicine, tried to introduce a pretty sophisticated Bayesian perspective. And, and I ended up doing my uh, thesis with a guy named Richard Royal, who was a statistician. And uh, when I presented my um, proposal, uh, the epidemiologist didn't know what to do with it because I was actually in epidemiology. And so the, uh, the chair consulted with a statistician in the, in the department and the statistician said, oh, that's, that's already old stuff. And, uh, and he was sort of right. As Ron said, this has been going on. This conversation has been going on not just for decades or for a century, probably for about two centuries 
or three, depending on exactly what you count. It's unbelievable. And in fact, the very inventor of the p-value himself, Fisher, uh, was very much a part of this. And, and, and you'll see some quotes from him. Um, but I talk about the epistemology of research because that's what we're talking about here is what, how do we know what we know and how do we represent what we know? And why are we still arguing about this? And I'll, I'll have some perspectives on this. So here's the ASA statement. I won't spend a second on this slide because uh, uh, Ron already did that. But what he didn't show you was the number of people who are in that original writing group who actually wrote a position paper in response to the statement. So this is actually almost all of these were in the original drafting group and all of them disagreed with some aspect of the statement um, and had more to say. And you see much more of that, obviously, in the current issue of the American Statistician. But I think this is as important as the principles that they could agree on was the, it was, first of all, how passionately they felt about their own uh, perspectives uh, and, and how much more they had to say. So this shows that, that statisticians uh, are really not aligned. This is a, I don't wanna say they're not aligned. This is an incredibly alive and, uh, and um, energetic area of intellectual inquiry. This is not, even though I say it's been going on for a long time, it's been going on for a long time for the same reason that we discuss philosoph that philosophy has been going on for a long time and that we discuss certain sort of irresolvable issues around the meaning of life. These issues are actually not going to go away with any technical fixes. Uh, this is the list of papers in the current issue of the 45 papers. So, so it has um, proliferated. This is literally a picture of my my uh, uh, folder that holds all the downloaded papers. So we see even more uh, perspectives here. Um, now I'm gonna show you a, a, a pair of quotes from this special issue of clinical trials, which we did in 2005, which was the proceedings of a conference that we had at the FDA. As you can see, the title was Can Bayesian Approaches to Studying Oops, typo. Uh, new treatments improve regulatory decision making. And the most illuminating part of this, I think, is the floor discussions. I'm going to show, show you a pair of quotes uh, from that floor discussion. You can see the, the list of people there. Many of the people on this list were part of the drafters of the statement in 2016. And I, and I do want to say, um, uh, Ron has done this, the, not just the, uh, the ASA a service, but society a service by being the person who has shepherded these uh, events. Uh, and I'll have more to say that uh, going forward. So anyway, here's the exchange. And it was between me and Bob Temple. Who here who knows Bob Temple? A lot don't. So he's the senior, um, senior advisor for science, senior policy person at the FDA. Um, he has been there since the early 70s and is a walking encyclopedia of every decision and every policy that, that the FDA has ever made. There is, I would say there's probably no person on earth who knows more about the workings and policies of the FDA than Bob Temple. Is that a fair summary? I saw somebody nodding over there. And he's very much at the heart of many current policies, um, either changing them or not changing them. So here he goes, he's been hearing about this for a long time. He says, of course, everybody knows that P less than 0.05 is sort of stupid. Head science officer at the, at the FDA. Why should it always be the same? The alternative to adopting a standards to actually determine a criteria for success on the spot for each new case. That's my idea of a nightmare. So we use a foolish, if you like, simplification. Maybe we adjust it sometimes when we feel we have to, but you simplify the process a little bit so you can get done, so you can get it done. I don't want to have a symposium for every new trial. Interesting. Me, having, a clear and consist having clear and consistent procedures often produces automaticity, that's the bright line stuff, that sometimes doesn't make sense. What you lose by ad adopting a new improved approach is some sort of, is some of the uh, automaticity. What you gain is some reasonableness, but you can't give away the store. So I was basically saying, this can be ridiculous sometimes, and maybe, can we find a middle ground? He was, he was painting the extreme that we develop a new procedure or, 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 or sort of in individually bespoke analysis and criteria for every drug application. So, but what you see here are two roles for statistical rules. And I think this is where 99% of the argument uh, is occurring. 
One is statistics and statistical methods as individual guides for analyses and interpretation of data. And this is largely tar targeted at experts, but analyses, of course, are often conducted by non-experts. The second role is as social technologies. That is, rules to aid collective data interpretation and decision making, in a sense, by the public. And I don't, it's not literally the public, but they're guideposts for non-experts, regulators, editors, policymakers, and the consumers of research. And we don't often think of statistics as social technologies, but that's what they are. And the problem with the debate is that what statisticians know best is number one is what makes sense to an, in an individual case. But when we develop a policy for the world, it's very hard to predict what the consequences of that policy will be. And we're totally out of, out of our element. We cannot say what will happen if we abandon statistical segments. That's a policy. And I'll talk more about this. But we have to make the distinction between statistics as a guide for analyses and good interpretations by people who know what they're doing, and statistics as a set of rules for people, in a sense, who don't know exactly what they're doing and are being consumed by people who know even less. This is a comment that was made by Ted Porter, who wrote a really wonderful book called Trust in Numbers, and it's about the social use of numbers. And he said, the use of statistical, statistics tests has become obligatory in scientific research. They work mainly as social technologies, not as guides to private thinking. The advances of statistics and medicine must be understood as responses to problems of trust, which have been most acute in the context of regulatory and disciplinary conf kind of confrontations. This and not in any inherently statistical character of clinical medicine explain, explains why inferential statistics entered medicine through therapeutics. So this is a very, very interesting comment. What does he mean by trust? It was, it was what gave birth to the FDA. It was the claims of companies, you know, selling tonics and nostrums and devices that were usually ineffective and often incredibly unsafe. And that's what gave birth to the FDA. And the FDA stood as a bulwark against these spurious claims and, and things that were really hurting people. And they had to develop 1962, uh, they were told that they had to have a process that guaranteed F safety and efficacy. And it actually wasn't until 1972 that they, dis that, uh, they defined the substantial evidence that you had to have, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So Fisher also, this is R.A. Fisher, commented essentially on this issue of social technologies versus private guides. This is a famous quote from Fisher, uh, and he's, he's actually commenting here on null hypothesis significance testing. Uh, or hypothesis testing, I should say. He said, the concept that the scientific worker can, can regard himself as an inert item in a vast cooperative concern working according to accepted rules is encouraged by stressing his supposed duty mechanically to make a succession of decisions. So this is all about hypothesis tests. The idea that this responsibility can be delegated to a giant computer programmed with decision functions, aka hypothesis tests, belongs to a fantasy of circles rather remote from scientific research. So he understood what was happening, that we were developing sort of this manufacturing system for science. And he was protesting. He thought that this would have bad consequences, exactly as pointed out in the report. Uh, now, the one thing that is important to understand is that social technologies are adopted and supported within social communities. And what's a social community? Well, it's many of the, the professional communities that we have. This is a social community. You are a social community. Dashu is a social community. In fact, you're using social media to create this community. And in medicine and in areas of science, it's often the sub-disciplines of science that create their own little virtual worlds. And they are the ones who teach each other methods and who you know, publish for each other and they read each other. And what you find is when you look across science, Statistical methods are actually quite different. I mean, when you look at the biomedical literature versus the economics literature, drastically different. Physics, drastically different. This is a methodology actually within biomedicine. Who, who knows about magnitude-based inference? Do you know where it's used? Anybody? Magnitude-based inference is a curious system of of uh, uh, logic that was actually proposed in the mid 2000s and it was used and is used almost exclusively in the sports medicine literature. 
and it it was used quite um, uh, prevalent. It was quite prevalent for about five to ten years until within the last several years, uh, a bunch of statisticians within the profession have, in a sense, debunked it and showed that it was not based on on. Uh, it didn't have a sound foundation. It was a way to avoid p-values. I, I won't go into it. The The point is that this existed within the sort of hermetically sealed community of sports medicine. Medicine, it's medicine, but they had their own methodology. So we have to recognize this balkanization of methodology and the fact that these customs and practices are maintained within communities. Um, the FDA two pivotal trial rule is a social technology. It's a rule. It actually doesn't make a lot of statistical sense. As you see here, what it says is, let's see if I can, ah. What it says is that, oh, this is really, I can't, um, okay, let's see if that works now. Okay, it says that if you have two significant trials out of a fair number, you win. That is, your drug is approvable. Now, obviously, they don't adhere to this rigidly. I'm not going to go into all that. But that's the basic sense of the rule. But it doesn't really make sense because, ah, this is, let's see if I can. Because what it says on the left-hand side, you see that there's only one trial there that's a winner. That's, that, that's statistically significant. On the right-hand side, <clears throat> there are two that are winners and two that are not. And basically, it's a meta-analytic procedure where you just add up how many winners you got. It almost doesn't matter how many zeros you have. So this, this is a crazy sort of rule. It doesn't actually add up the trials properly. It uses boat counting. Um, but it's clear. And companies know how to play by these rules. And arguably, it's way better than what was before. So this is really interesting. It's a, it's a technology that I think the FDA probably actually will be changing in the next few years uh, and is already modifying in practice. But it has stood up to a lot of pressure, although it's induced a lot of actually uh, practices that we don't want to see, like gaming and evidence suppression and outcome switching, all things to get a win on those trials. <clears throat> has lots of problems. But it, it is a social statistical technology. And that's the point I want to make, that these are very different things. And sometimes these things can work pretty well. It might be better than alternatives. So here we have this, as has been pointed out, the cry to uh, uh, um, get rid of statistical significance. And here is one person pushing back, perhaps surprisingly, John Ioannidis, my colleague at Stanford. And he, within weeks or days of that statement, because we all knew it was coming, published two the commentaries, one in JAMA and one in Nature, saying, let's not give up. And let me just read one of his points. This is the last paragraph. The statistical numeracy of the scientific workforce require, uh, requires improvement. Banning statistical significance while retaining p-values will not improve numeracy and may foster statistical confusion, create problematic issues with study interpretation, a state of statistical anarchy. In other words, Bob Temple's nightmare. That's exactly what he's talking about. Uniformly and statistical rules and processes make it easier to compare like with like, avoid having some associations and effects be more privileged than others in unwarranted ways. Without clear rules for the analyses, science and policy may less rely less on data and evidence and more on subjective opinions and interpretations. So I would submit that the reason that this is an argument about the impact of the social impact of that abandonment of significance about which we all might have opinions, but I submit we have no idea. Each of us knows our own community pretty well, and I actually sort of side with John here, sort of. It's complicated. It would take me half an hour just to say exactly. Probably if we were both in the room together, we'd pretty much agree. But what I will say is that it's very hard to know what will happen when you make these uh, technologic changes in communities where their behavior and their knowledge, you don't really know. This is more in the, reign, the realm of sociology and politics and, social, and you know, understanding social movements than it is in statistics. And that's why we can't agree. Almost everywhere you will see in every statement, if we do this, people will do this. But we have no idea. 
or maybe it's the people we met last week will do this, or maybe the people who actually listen to me will do this, but we don't know what the social consequences would be. And that's why this debate continues and continues and continues. <clears throat> so I actually decided to skip over all of this and make a proposal that appeared in Nature uh, a few months ago, uh, which says, I, I, because I've been writing about technical fixes and Bayes factors, I'll show you that in a second, you know, for over 30 years. Actually, in one of those commentaries, I said, why do I keep doing this? I mean, why do I like keep spitting in the wind? It just keeps coming back in my face. It doesn't make any difference. Why do I keep writing these papers? <clears throat> this was a way to actually jump over it and say, just at the end of the day, say how confident you are in your claim. Just say it. <clears throat> Are you 90% sure that this is true? 70% sure? Just say how sure you are. Now, this got some pushback and it's continuing to because how does anybody know how sure they are? But the problem is this actually represents one of the problems that has been engendered by the use of p-values and hypothesis testing is that we have not developed our own sense of how to put a number on how sure we are. And we do know when we are really sure versus not really sure at all. And I use this example, um, I'm not going to spend much time on it, uh, uh, in, in teaching where I show a study that was actually done, a randomized trial on an on a <clears throat> entity that I'm calling denosumab. And it was a randomized trial where the, of a, a thousand patients in CCU, half got it, half didn't. And uh, there was a significant reduction, P equals 0.04. I didn't, I didn't censor myself. Statistically significant reduction in the intensity of CCU care. Uh, among the group, and it was a well-done study that got denosumab. And then I asked audiences, how sure are you that denosumab, you know, works, has a non-zero effect? Let me ask you, I'm just going to say, 1,000 patients, well-done study, 10% uh, reduction in CCU score P of 0.04. How many of you would think it's more than 50%, more than 50% chance that this drug works? More than 50%. Nobody's answering. How many less than 50%? Uh, see, everybody's basically scared to answer. So, <laughs> so for those online, 90% did not answer. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you what denosumab is. It was actually prayer. It, and it was not prayer by the relatives. It was prayer by a bunch of people who were sitting in the lobby, not knowing who they were praying for, and the patients didn't know that they were being prayed for. So when I ask this to any audience that has the courage to answer, um, a huge, there's a huge shift in the number who think that this is unlikely when I show them this. So this shows we do have a sense of what makes things you know, plausible or not, but we don't know how to put a number on it and we don't know how to calculate it. And we don't know how the p-value affects it. But it's very clear. People absolutely view these two differently when, the one, when they think it's a monoclonal antibody versus a uh, prayer. And I will say, I, I put in denosumab because of like, dunno, I don't know what it is. The, the, the last time I gave this talk just a few weeks ago, somebody came up to me and said, you know, there really is a denosumab. And <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should change the slide. So I decided you guys maybe didn't know that. So I kept it the same. Okay, so the, the FDA is re recognizing that there are these different contexts, and you're seeing it reflected in the different criteria for all these different approval pathways, orphan drugs, accelerated approval, fast track, priority review, breakthrough. And I just want to say a few things uh, to, before I finish up, is that they're recognizing that there are lots of things that affect actual decisions, but we have to be able to have a framework that separates the evidence from, from a study from our belief, the inference from that study, and finally the justification for action. And this is something that Richard Royal made a big point about. And this is not something that we, a lot of people have clear in their heads, that there are three separate components. Assessment of the evidence, the you know, measurement of belief, and then the decision. And each one of these brings in new factors. Uh, belief is based on evidence, but it brings in other evidence. Action is based on belief, but it brings in consequences. So these three things are very different. And of course, what gets us from one place to another is uh, the Bayes factor. And I've often pushed, I just have to say, my technical uh, uh, proposal is that we use the, the minimum Bayes factor, just e to the minus z squared over two, the same z score that goes into calculating the p-value as the base, as, as the, in a sense, the replacement for the p-value. It does a lot of things. It, can't, it just says how much belief has moved. 
It doesn't use a prior. It introduces notions of Bayes and strength of evidence without forcing people to, artic to quantify things that they find com difficult to um, articulating. And it's about three times larger than the p-value, which is the same moderation of evidence that was implied in the, in the p-value statement. So it gets us a lot of the way, and this is how I describe what a p-value of 0.05 means. It gets you from these starting points, 1% to 2 to 6, 10% to 21 to 43. I won't explain the ranges here. Um, but this is how I explain to people what, what it means. And I think, you know, these kinds of tools are the kinds of tools we're going to have to use um, in teaching. So I'm not going to talk. So where do we go from here? One, we have to take the long view. There are no quick fixes because statistical customs and practices are enforced by many entities within many fields, by, by regulators, by editors, by funders, by our colleagues. We can't just flip a switch and change it all. Um, the, the changes have to be accepted and driven by the scientists in their own fields. And right now we have a movement that we can ride on, which is the movement to improve research, what we'll call research reproducibility. And we need to ride that horse because it's mobilizing scientists in every field and it's not just about statistics, but statistics has been identified as a key part. Really influential leverage points are published articles that use different methods. There's nothing that sends a signal than an article in JAMA or New England Journal or any prominent journal in a, in a discipline using a method. It shows it's publishable and it shows that it is socially accepted. It sends a powerful social message. The ASA and others need to develop a multifaceted strategy. We need curriculum. We need to train the trainers. It's hard to teach this stuff because we don't have models. The textbooks don't teach it. And we also have to teach it knowing that, that we also have to teach our students how to publish and read their own literature. So we can't teach them things that won't be publishable. So this is a really tricky thread and we have, need to develop strategies and I hope Regina can help us with that. We need new online and downloadable teaching tools. We need to team up with field spe specific statisticians and reformers and maybe commission applied examples for these publications. Um, and finally, we need to partner with and learn from sociologists of science, people who understand social movements and how things change it's unbelievable how, you know, when I talk to one of those, how much I learn and how much they know about things that we're swimming in and we don't see, we just don't see. So how sure am I that that's the right, um, those are the right recommendations? Well, I'm 95% sure that those are part of the solution and 100% sure that other people, including those in this room, can improve on them. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, that's a wonderful remark. Um, can I ask you quickly to also comment um, on, you know, because you bring, you, you brought up, um, you know, there's uh, ASA needs to develop a strategy, you know, for, for younger generation and especially you deal with students, you face students every day. Uh, so that's our next generation, the leaders for a statistician and also data scientists. So could you elaborate that on that a little bit more? Like um, in your opinion, um, you know, what's your proposal here? Um, so I think this would be great for the, the comment, you know, for the panel discussion, because this takes too long. It depends who the student is and how long you have them. When I have, you know, medical fellows who want to know how to do research and I have them for a day, or an hour, I just have to teach them how to read their own literature. And, and they don't even understand what they're seeing. They don't understand what a conference symbol is. I mean, I, I have to decode the language. So I can't teach them this stuff. I've experimented. I have an intensive, one of the courses I teach is an intensive one week course. I once tried giving them the p-value lecture. I really wanted to give them right at the beginning. They got actually really upset because they, they already knew they were confused. They didn't want to be pre-reconfused pre before they started. I gave the same lecture at the end of the course and they actually liked it. So it depends who it is and how long and what's the purpose. And we live in a world where these, uh, the, the, the methods we're criticizing here are used and we have a responsibility to some applied students to, to let them understand what they're reading and then how we layer onto that proper communication and understanding and nuance, I think that is the real challenge. If you're talking about how to train statisticians and epidemiologists, uh, I don't want to use up too much time, so maybe we can address that in, in the panel discussion. I think that's a different, completely different answer. 
and, and we need to do a much better job there. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Wedi Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong has over 20 years of experience in biopharma uh, industry, including directing, directing biometrics effort in more than 10 NDA and SNDA submissions, three advisory committee meetings, and multiple ex-US submissions, all leading to successful approval. Wedi is currently vice president of biometrics at Theravance Biopharma, a company focusing on creating medicines that help improve the lives of patients suffering from serious illness. Thank you. Um, I really need to know Regina because my family has no idea what I do. You know, I have a hard time explaining to them. You know, I, I do with the data and then the model and then tell them if the drug works. So I really need to get to know Regina better. So um, in preparation for today's talk, I was trying to come up with a catchy title. I quite like the real world, you know, uh, beyond uh, moving beyond the, the significance of P less than 0.05, but I was trying to be creative and come up with my own catchy title. So I thought about, mm, I'm not, oh. Is it this? Just press this one. Oh, oh this one. It's, it's not working. Oh, is it? Okay. I thought about my love and hate relationship with um, P values. I thought about P values, can't live with them, can live without them, or statistical significance to be or not to be. Um, but I finally decided on you know, something maybe more mundane. It's really one statistician's thoughts on p-value or maybe just a random rebel. Um, so first of all, I think of um, p-value um, 0.05 as a line in the sand, especially in the confirmatory trials. The hope is that with this line in the sand, um, researchers will be less inclined or tempted to make impromptu conclusions based on the data observed, kind of like the nightmare. Um, Bob Tempo was talking about. Oh, sorry. I should have wear high here, huh? <laughs> P-value doesn't pro prove definitively that the drug works. On the other hand, when P-value greater than 0.05, it doesn't mean that the drug doesn't work and we should just give up. P-value gives us a sense of how extreme the test statistics is if the null hypothesis is indeed true. The smaller the P-value, and the less likely that one would observe such an extreme value if the test drug is not different from placebo. So on a more pragmatic note, as someone who has exclusively worked in the biopharmaceutical industry, p-value to me is what regulators and editors use to evaluate the experiment. It is not the sole criterion, but often it's viewed as an essential one. So in the ASA special issue about p-value, Benjamin and Berger stated that p-value is all about the no hypothesis. It says nothing about the um, alternative hypothesis, and that is true. But the problem is not the p-value itself, but the, how p-value is being used and interpreted by researchers. And Benjamin and Berger also suggested that P less than 0.05 is not rigorous enough. Maybe we should start considering P less than 0.005. So immediately two issues came to mind when I read that. Um, one, we know that when you put an extra zero in front of the phi, that increased the sample size about 60%. And so if we think that cost for drug development, it's high, you know, try to multiply that by 1.6. Um, for one, I don't want to be the one who said to our CEO and said, um, as part of the statistical community, we have decided that the goalpost is now P less than 0.05, so please multiply all of our budget by 1.6. Um, also, two is even you know, simply moving the goalpost, all the issues we talked about, how p-value doesn't speak to, um, you know, take the no hypo uh, take the alternative hypothesis into consideration, how it doesn't speak to the strengths of the evidence. I think it still exists, even if we simply just move the goalpost, you know, to a higher uh, level or to a smaller. Uh, maybe the um, kind of the probability or the level of misuse will be less because the hurdle is high. But I see that all the fundamental issues we're trying to solve with the p-value equal 0.5 will still be there. 
And also going back to the drawing a line in the sand, if you set out to test a hypothesis at the 5% significance level, then you have to abide by the 5% threshold to me, in my opinion. So to me, follow this line in the sand helps protect the rigor of the experiment. And, or perhaps we could think of it as a guide to the researchers not to draw conclusions unwarranted or unsupported by your prior hypothesis. You know, don't make sort of random conclusion just because you happen to see something. And to me, the, this P equal 0.05 or trying to cross this threshold is more about protecting the type one error rate than defining success. And I agree that we should not use the line of P equal 0.05 in the sand to make dichotomous decision. A P value of 0.051 or 0.05 seven doesn't mean one should just pack up and go home. It means statistically speaking, we didn't achieve the extreme or the level of statistical threshold we set out to do. One of the very fascinating, I think it's the most more interesting part of a statistician's job working in industry is that when you have a failed trial or fail in the sense that you didn't meet the prospectively defined threshold you're trying to clear, and statistician job is really to dig into the data and understand the reasons why. Did you see a smaller too many facts compared to what you were anticipating? Why? Did you see a larger variability than what you're anticipating? Why? Did some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria contribute to this smaller too many fact or larger variability? And why, why, why? Um, and on the other hand, when you achieve P equal less than 0.05, you know, that doesn't mean before you pop open the champagne, you know, one also needs to look at the data with the same rigor and earnest. In my opinion, you need to look at the treatment effect. Is it clinical meaningful? Does all the other secondary endpoints, P value less than 0.05 or not, do they all point in the same direction? Do you see any unexpected treatment by subgroup interaction? And I think this Probably I'll speak to what Ron and, and Steve talked about, you know, putting the data in context. You know, P, P equal 0.05, it's a guy, but there's much more beyond that single um, value. Um, oftentimes that I'm asked by senior management and said, you know, um, when there's a time to data read out, they always said, why does it take three to five days? You know, haven't you been preparing this for weeks and months, you know, with the team of programmer, you know, why, why can't you just give me the, the p-value for the primary efficacy table in like two hours after the database lock? Or better yet, how about five minutes, you know? And I often, my response is our top line results often involved hundreds of table. It's not just the primary or key secondary endpoint, it's all the subset analysis, it's all the sensitivity analysis, it's looking at the outlier, are there any unexpected you know, results? Um, also, that safety is important too. You know, it's when you also always, when you have done your job and reviewed the data in totality, that you can really present a, what I think it's a painted, a. Um, sort of painted a, a, a credible risk benefit picture to senior management. You know, it tells you about, you know, tells you about the, the drug effect is truly, is the drug truly benefit patient and does it the benefit outweigh the, the risk? Um, but I will be the first to admit that when the programming validation is done, the first table I open is the primary endpoint. And then the first number I looked is the p-value, so. <laughs> Um, so since p-value only focuses on the null hypothesis, some researchers suggest that using Bayes vector, um, since I'm not a Bayesian by any stretch of imagination, I'm just going to quickly offer my thoughts before the Bayesian in the room, you know, are onto me and call my bluff. But to me, um, I feel like whether you use a base vector or a p-value, um, I, I think the, the principle is the same. You still have to draw a line in the sand, right? So what number, what is the value of a base vector that should be considered as a supporting strong evidence of a treatment effect? And then the other thing, the way I understand is the base vector is sensitive to the model assumption and the choice of a prior. And so it depends on what you assume, um, 
for the prior distribution, you may, based on the same set of data, actually either draw a conclusion that's completely different from the one that's drawn based on the p-value or the same. And so this is always a little bit sort of confusing to me. So maybe the, the Bayesians in the room can, you know, be generous in educating me. So um, statistical significance. So to me, I wanted to come to the defense of the statistical significance a little bit. Perhaps the proper statement that we think, you know, sort of from a purist view, this is what we should write. Based on the data, study X has shown that if the no hypothesis of no treatment difference is true, the probability of observing a test statistics as extreme or more extreme than the one that is observed in the current data, it's 0.024. But honestly, who talks like that, right? Um, so I imagine over time, we probably got lazy and decided to use statistical significance for short. But of course, people not fully appreciate, you know, how best to interpret p-value and type 1 error started misusing the term statistical significance. Examples include, you know, researchers claim statistical significance when the p-value was based on a post hoc analysis, but the primary pre-specified analysis failed to cross the pre-specified 0.05 boundary or testing multiple endpoints without any prior pre-specified hypothesis and say, ooh, ooh, I like this one, you know, and then find a way to explain why this is the, you know, why this is demonstrate a treatment effect. Or um, in a group sequential design, a pre-specified alpha for the final test should have been 0.03, and the actual p-value was 0.035, the authors claim statistical significance because the p-value was less than 0.05. True story but this was a long time ago, of course. Um, so all these examples point to the lack of sophistication of the users about what is the proper use of statistical significance, but it's not the fault of the term itself. It's like if a person ran a red light driving a Ferrari um, and got into an accident, is the fault of the driver or is the fault of the Ferrari, right? So. I'm definitely not opposing to replacing statistical significance, but it has to be succinct and to the point and really clearly convey the rigor we're hoping the researchers will comply. Whether we continue to use statistical significance or another alternative, I see it as the regulators and editors' responsibilities, in addition to us as um, researchers, to make sure the claims about statistical significance are truly valid. So when Rachel put up the, the survey, I was a little bit nervous. I was like, oh, it's, you know, it depends on the responses. It's too late to change my slide. But um, in preparation for this, I actually reread um, Steve's 2008 paper titled A Dirty Dozen 12 P-Value Misconceptions. And all of his points are valid, um, still very much so, 10 years after it has been published. And as well as as we have all seen how p-value was misused or misinterpreted, like in the Ferrari example, it's the researchers, not the p-value's fault that it was misused or misinterpreted. In the same article, Steve also put up a table uh, comparing base factor, the evidential property, I believe he called it, evidential property of base factor comparing to p-value, and I think the score was six to one in favor of base factor. So let's just say that, um, and I know that other uh, researchers have you know, proposed different measures, different derivatives of p-value, but let's just say that uh, we can convince all the critics and skeptics and the Bayesian challenged, like me, regulator and editors that base factor is the way to go. I don't see this happening overnight, uh, regardless how the old house is moldy, has you know leaky roof or broken window, we can move into the shiny new house until it is ready. Establish, establishing a new norm, a new standard will take some time. Um, Steve said that the movement to get rid of the p-value started like many decades ago, and, and so far it's not working. Why is that? Um, also paraphrasing um, Steve again, by the way, thank you, Steve. You, you may not know this, but you practically wrote my talking points today. <laughs> <laughs> so paraphrasing Steve again, then the, you know, um, the new norm and new standard may have its own baggage as well. It may solve some limitations associated with p-value that created new ones. Um, 
so now in the new house, the roof is not leaking, but we may find that the switch was totally on the wrong side of the house or that we forgot to put a closet in one of the bedrooms. So I, I definitely applaud the ASA's movement in issuing this special um, issue and contributions from all the researchers. The thought about getting rid of p-value to me is very provocative, um, but perhaps only then um, that we can urge the community to seriously come up with a new standard. And my hope is that learning from the, you know, many decades long journey with p-value um, put it in context, obviously only lasted 10 years. Um, so the community will thoughtfully put forward a new norm and new standard that clearly communicates the strengths of evidence, the uncertainty, discouraged dichotomous thinking, and also doesn't fall prey of misuse and misinterpretation. I'm looking forward to the new era, but don't know when it will arrive. And until then, I for one am not ready to abandon the ship for p-value just yet. Instead, I think we should work together to properly educate our colleagues, our collaborators, on what is the proper interpretation of p-value, promote good statistical practice with the goal of upholding high scientific rigor and integrity, communicate not just the signal, but also the uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wedi. Um, a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned, you know, um, some really nice example from your past working experiences. I like the example you gave about, okay, why can't we just have the top line results in five minutes? Um, so I'm curious to know uh, in your company or in the, with the people that you talk to after, um, you know, the Nature article, Jama articles, um, What's your discussion? Is there any discussion from your colleagues? Um, what's the discussion looks like? Um, yes, they, there has been some question. Actually, I have several people forwarding me the article. Um, but I think most of the reason, or at least the primary motivation, is it to say, see, you don't let us say there's a treatment effect when p-value is not you know, less than 0.05. So I think the, the motivation was, um, so I, I, that's why I, I think, you know, p-value is, is a guide, you know, obviously it's not a do or die situation if you're on the, you know, opposite side of p-value. But to me, at least in the, you know, especially in the confirmatory, the lay phase trial, you need to have a sort of um, a guideline and to tell you whether or not you have actually achieved what you have set out to do. Thank you so much, Wedi. Um, now let's welcome our last speaker, Dr. Imola Fodor. She is the Global Head of Oncology Biostatistics for Early Development and for the Hematology Franchise at Genentech Roche. She joined Genentech as a Senior Statistical Scientist in the Non-Clinical Biostatistics Group in 2007. And since then, she held positions of increasing responsibility including director of the non-clinical and statistical methods and research groups and senior director of the breast cancer franchise. Her experiences span from research and early development through late stage clinical development and manufacturing. Welcome, Imola. Thank you very much. I first would like to acknowledge Dr. Xu and SBSA for uh, supporting this event and also my fellow panelists and attendees for coming to, to this discussion. And also colleagues present and present, you know, this is certainly a topic that has been around for a while and I really benefited from having a number of different discussions. Uh, so just a bit of background about where I come from and what experiences have shaped my views. I've been for the last 12 years at Genentech in a number of different roles that includes research, research, exploratory research, right, or research is exploratory in all therapeutic areas, um, preclinical development, non-clinical development, manufacturing, and most recently I am in late stage uh, clinical development. Now prior to that, um, I had the uh, opportunity to work with a number of scientists in different domains, including astronomy and the geosciences, and um, I got my uh, degree uh, from Berkeley. And uh, prior to that, I actually had a background in a number of different quantitative sciences. Now, what attracted me to stay in statistics, to do statistics, was this opportunity to work in a number of different scientific areas and really to bring that quantitative thinking 
the rigor to help formulate questions and help address uh, those questions. Um, so to me, statistics is not about one method. It's not about being a Bayesian or a frequentist. It's really about statistical thinking. It is about how we can have the clarity of thinking and the rigor to solve questions and address uncertainty. And so for those of you who have not read the Statistical Models and Shoe Letter by David Friedman, I highly recommend it. The bottom line is models cannot rescue you. You have to think, we have to use our shoe letter to do the actual work to understand the problem and find uh, solutions. Um, and as a statistician, I feel like, you know, I do have the responsibility for advocate for statistical thinking, no matter what domain I work in. And just like some of the panelists, I am quoting um, from way back in the 1950s. Interestingly, this was said by H.G. Wells, a science fiction writer, that statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. Now, to me, that day is here. And especially, you know, big data is here today. I think it is so important that we do advocate for this statistical thinking. And we have this opportunity to not let this uh, challenge go to waste, right, so to speak. And again, Wilkes back in um, 1951 was quoting um, H.G. Wells about this. Now, back to the day. Uh, why are we here today? Um, yes, I think, you know, I don't have to uh, introduce the topic. We have uh, heard it before, you know, this statement from the ASA and also um, kind of some counter arguments for retiring statistical significance that was also uh, published in Nature in terms of the correspondence, you know, what are the potential pitfalls for retiring significance? Um, will we give a free pass to bias? Do we just need to raise the bar? Or, you know, can we keep hypothesis testing? Um, this isn't talking the community. Now, at my workplace, I have been approached by not just statisticians, but also clinical scientists, you know, uh, medical monitors. They, have, they are reading the literature. They are asking, what do you think? What is your opinion about this? Um, so now I will show a few of the opinions, you know, in our virtual hallway. I work at a global company, so this comes from different sites. Um, again, depending on which particular group statisticians sit in, there is a variety of opinions. The end of the p-value, hopefully. I will put the last nail in the coffin. I had an early call with the KOL to explain why it is not appropriate to use p-values in a, in a manuscript. Um, then, some saying, well, Fisher saw the p-value just as a handy number to quantify the evidence against the null. I'm wondering if we can just blame the p-value for everything. Isn't it just a tool? It is one tool among the many different tools that we have at our disposals. And I saw the Nature article saying statistically non-significant. I know my stat professor would not be happy. And um, just, I would like to believe that it's not a tool itself. It is how we use it and whether we truly understand it. So, how do I personally interpret all the information out there? Well, when I synthesize it, uh, I am led to three conclusions. Do not abandon significance. Do understand its proper use. And do communicate clearly and transparently about significance or any other method that you choose to um, use in your problem. Now I will have one slide on each of those three points. Do not abandon significance. I think to me, dogmatically banning significance will not serve our call, solve our current challenges. Um, I have to say that I do agree with the problems and we should not dichotomize. However, I think this point goes perhaps to Steve's point on we don't socially know what the effect will be. If you just say abandon statistical significance, how will that solve the problem? Will it lead to other problems that we are not anticipating? And again, we may have different challenges that we need to articulate and address them appropriately. Uh, here I'm again quoting a number of... Um, papers in, in the editorial, you know, irreproducible, irreproducible research, call it of the isolated study. I think they are all kind of addressing different problems. 
and uh, the point that introducing alternative imperfect methods will probably add to the confusion, not necessarily solve the dilemmas that we have today. And uh, to Steve's uh, to challenge you, or to maybe not, I am also um, including this quote from Ioannidis: the importance of predefined analyses and do not, not abandoning statistical significance. And you know, for the audience, I did not <laughs> compare notes with Steve before, <laughs> but I just thought that this is an important viewpoint to also bring into the discussion. Again, understanding significance, you know, how are we using it? I'm not saying that there is a whole lot of areas that it makes sense, um, particularly in exploratory analyses, for sure, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I would argue that in conformatory, st conformatory studies, when you have a pre-specified analysis, it does make some sense to include it, right? It provides a simple framework with interpretable operating characteristics. Completely agree it's imperfect, um, but how can we ensure as much as possible that the results are reliable? And alpha equals 0.05, well, it gives you one out of 20 to conclude that there was a difference when there is none. With that said, statistical significance is really a very, very small part of the bigger picture. The multi interpretation is multidisciplinary. The scientific context, what is the relevant treatment size? What do patients like, society, pricing issues? What is the biological plausibility, previous evidence, consistent with the endpoints? These are all uh, quantities that we have to incorporate in the decision making. It's never about a p-value and statistical significance. And my last point is about communication. Um, and here I put communication in the middle of three points because communication goes two ways, right? We have to educate ourselves. We have to be curious to understand the context we are working with. And we also, um, we have to learn, you know, from our collaborators and we have to educate as well. Uh, but to me, this is one of the most important jobs of a statistician to really have that clarity of communicating with others on the, um, again, understanding the question and then bringing the best method uh, to answer it. So I'm really excited to hear uh, that um, hiring of a new communication specialist uh, because I think that is very, very uh, much needed um, for, for informing our larger public and also uh, ourselves. And um, to me, you know, it's all up to us to contribute to increase the statistical and scientific literacy. And what I'm trying to do is in my own sphere of work, to really make sure that I do the best as I can to, uh, again, advocate for the statistical thinking and using the right methods for the right approach. With that, you know, I'll just go to my summary. Do not abandon significance, know how to use it and communicate clearly. Uh, with that said, I'm agreeing with the ASA editorial on the issues of we have to go beyond statistical significance and we have to use statistical thinking, going back to my initial point of the importance of statistical thinking. And then we really have to um, accept uncertainty, be thoughtful, open and modest. I don't necessarily like to memorize new acronyms, but to me, all of these words do resonate and this is what I believe we um, have to do. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Imola. Um, and I would like to quickly ask you the very similar question to a previous panelist. Um, I really like your last point about communication um, because it's really about the clarity and transparency. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on what, when we communicate or articulate the uncertainty to the non-statistician colleagues, what are the watch out from your past experiences? I know you mentioned, okay, in the exploratory uh, setting versus confirmatory setting, maybe there's different focuses. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? I think, again, to me, it's context specific. And, and one approach that I find personally helpful is have some simulations, right? You know, if you think that we understand the operating characteristic of a method, 
well, we show it by simulation that it's maybe not what we expected it to be, right? So that tends to bring a lot of kind of clarity to the collaborators uh, who may not find it intuitive to um, talk in statistical jargon, for example. All right, thank you. Um, now let's open up for floor panel uh, discussion. I would like to invite four of you um, to sit in the front. Um, And before we start, I would like to remind folks on the line, uh, there is a Q&A um, chat box uh, that you can uh, send in questions for the folks online. Uh, you can type in your questions and uh, we have Andre in the back to help us filter uh, the questions or picking up the questions um, so that um, we can, you know, bring your questions to the, to the panelists. Um, all right, um, so thank you for each one of your wonderful remark. Um, I would like to ask you, do you have comments on each other? <laughs> you need to press the yes. I'm actually not going to comment on the others right now, but I, I do want to say something that I wanted to say in my talk, which is to commend Ron for what he has done in guiding this process over the last two to three years. It's, it's unbelievable. Because the way this has happened has been, you know, basically disgruntled people like myself writing isolated articles, as I say, spitting in the wind over, over decades. Occasionally conferences brought together where, you know, usually Bayesian type conferences like the one I had where people of like mind uh, got together and, you know, bemoaned the, the, how everybody around us didn't see our brilliant wisdom. Um, but by, but the, some of the social movement issues that I talked about what, what Ron is doing is to provide the nucleus for exactly that by, by marshalling the energy of, and, and passion and interest of all these statisticians who really care deeply about these things and giving them a forum and a platform to write these papers. I mean, that's an amazing resource that itself could be a whole curriculum. And then to write an incredible uh, uh, editorial, the, the most recent one, a, a synthetic uh, summary piece that tried to cover the landscape of all 45 papers and knit them into some coherent uh, uh, summary has really been amazing. And it sort of shows a conscientiousness and, and allegiance and a follow-up, you know, both the, the original process of developing the, the, um, manus the, the, the statement, the follow-on, all the commentaries written by the people who supposedly drafted the statement, then a conference following that, and then 45 papers. This is how things happen. I mean, this is how you move fields, and it doesn't happen by accident. So I really want to thank you for having done what you did. Steve, I, I just wanted to say that when you put that list of all the papers up, I realized why I was so tired. <laughs> yeah. And I would also like to make the comment that, you know, for me personally, it was just so great to read some of the articles. I didn't read all of them, I have to admit, but I read quite a few of them, right? And, and just the, the, some of the ideas that are being proposed, I believe will definitely make a difference, you know, in terms of the FDA recommendations, regulations, for example, Frank Harrell, Lisa Lavange and others, you know, have this proposal of, of using Bayesian methods, right? To uh, incorporate prior evidence into the decision-making framework, right? So I definitely think that we are moving and there will be kind of right direction. Um, to me, what will be still important is the pre-specification, right? No matter what method we use, we understand what we are proposing. But again, uh, really commend ASA and Ron on, on all the um, effort that has been going on. I'll just mention too that um, Tong article that you uh, pointed out the, uh, uh, at, writes very strongly about uh, pre-specification and the value of all that, and also is just as strong about not using inference. Thank you. Just as strong about not using inference for those um, exploratory studies suggests that you describe, describe, describe on those exploratory studies and, and leave it at that, not, not be in such a big hurry to, to, inf uh, to do inference when it's not justified. I completely agree with that, yes.
and they want to publish something in a conference, they really want that p-value. And I resist and I say, sorry, this is not appropriate, it's exploratory. But they said, nobody will believe us if you don't put the p-value. Right. And that's why I appreciate, Stephen, what you said about the socialization. I think this is also where it should go as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Rezi Zawadzki. I'm uh, the VP of uh, Biometrics at Immune Therapeutics. Great. And to also echo what Rezi said, it, it's, not, okay. it's not just the, the researcher, the, um, the people we collaborate with, but oftentimes I'll be asked to say, you know, you see a P, uh, see an A event and there's a difference of X percentage. And so the, the clinician will ask for a, a P value. And I said, well, you can't do that. You have to describe the data, whether or not you think there's actually a meaningful difference and what could possibly contribute this difference. And then we'll submit, you know, and I have to bite them tooth and nail. And then when we submit the journal, the feedback that, that coming from the reviewer would say, this event looks different. There's a, you know, please provide a p-value. And, and so it, it's a matter of whether or not you want to be accepted, you know, do you address the reviewer or do you fight and say, reviewers, you are wrong. You know, the p-value is not justified in this case. I mean, one, one thing that I, I think all the papers and the statement does is it gives you something official to give back to the editor. And you can say to the editor, I'm willing to do it, but this is what's out there. You know, as opposed to citing some favorite paper of yours that's your favorite statistician wrote saying that, there's now a, a much more official stamp. And I don't think you should be afraid of going back to editors. Nobody's going to reject your article because you didn't or did not uh, in, include the p-value. They, they might demand ultimately that you do it, and then you have to do it. But if you explain why, and, and, and I, I work, I've worked for 30 years at the Annals of Internal Medicine, we're very receptive to counter, you know, arguments uh, if they're reasoned, um, and just explain why. And I, I think the sense that the, that the journals demand certain things is wrong. They there is pressure and there's lack of understanding from reviewers. And when you talk about education, it's educating editors and reviewers as well. And that's how you, how you do it: is you write a reasoned response and say, "I'm willing to do it." but I don't think it's good science and the ASA, you know, and this is why. However, if you demand it, I'll do it. And if enough people do it, you will see better practice modeled. It won't happen in every journal at all times, but this will also push the journals themselves to change their practices and be more open to different ways of presenting things. The journals, you know, we, we talk about them as though they're separate from us. They're actually a mirror of us and they can't get out ahead of their contributors too far. So they, they can't be the cure, but neither are they the, the disease. They, they can be, the, the reviewers come from our communities, the editors come from our communities, and, and they can be reasoned with. So um, it won't work every time, but if we continue to do this, we'll get more and more good examples. You need to compare the demographic characteristics of placebo and treated and put p-value. I tried to fight it very hard. <laughs> I didn't succeed, but hopefully maybe it made a dent for the future. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Actually, Journal. I spoke to Frank Harrell about it. And he said he's working on it hard. So yeah, we'll see. New England Journal is a, a pain sometimes. Can we, so, sorry. Can, can we make it much simpler for academia, abundant p-value and significant uh, statistical significance, but for industry, keep p-value and the significance. As you said, if, okay, whenever the journal if require some uh, unreasonable p-value, sometimes you can argue with them, but uh, most time we also get uh, the your know, health agency, you know, required p-value, particularly for the European, European agency, regardless, even for the even for the adverse events, give the p-value between the low, no matter how to interpret, we want to see it. Well, the regulatory agencies are changing. So the 20th Century Cures Act, the, all the guidances that are going to be coming out of the FDA in the next three to five years, some of which are already coming out, are showing flexibility. So the boat is slowly turning. What's going to happen is it's going to slow, 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 slow. And then all of a sudden it's going to look like there's an avalanche overnight. It's going to look like a, a, a change overnight because there's going to be a flipping of the switch. And we're going to, but, but we'll all know that the old people then will know that it didn't happen overnight, that it took 40 years of pushing. And that's the way all things happen. So 
uh, I, I do, you're right, ENA and, and FDA are, are, are roadblocks to certain kinds of reform, but they are also facilitating it. And there's a lot of creative thinking that's going on there as, as we speak. And Bayes is in, you know, congressional legislation now. Congressional legislation, the word Bayes is there. Uh, so I think we're in a, you know, that boat is shifting. So exactly when it will turn or when the, you know, the earth will crack. It's hard to, it's hard to predict earthquakes, but when they happen, they can, you know, either produce a lot of damage, but they certainly produce a lot of change. To me. Uh, hi, uh, Doug Milliken, and my firm is Acudata Solutions. Uh, when you talk about social technologies, Dr. Goodman, uh, you mentioned that there are different social policy bodies that need to make go, no go decisions. And you use the FDA as one example of a social body that is in charge of policy decisions. Uh, and therefore they serve as a judge and jury uh, for the, the use of statistics. But there are other judges and juries that are consumers of the science. Uh, there are investor groups, there are payer and reimbursement groups uh, who make adoption decisions. Uh, you just mentioned journal editors who have a stake in the reputation of the quality of the research that's published in their journal. And you recommended training and better communication on the part of uh, statisticians on alternatives to uh, p-values such as the Bayes factor. But is it enough to educate the statistical practitioners when it is the decision makers who need a tool. Uh, and the analogy uh, that comes to my mind is trial lawyers. They can argue all day about whether the, uh, the burden beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt is the right burden of evidence. But until the law is changed, that is the, uh, that is the criterion that they have to live with. And uh, I guess, uh, while I applaud the movement among statisticians who don't even agree among themselves about uh, the use of p-value, then how can we involve, how can we convince these other groups, uh, some more scientific than others, uh, some that take a long view and uh, others like investor groups who take very short-term views, who need quick decisions, uh, how can we convince those groups to move away from the isolated tyranny of the p-value? Well, we have two hours here, yes. right? <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, um, you're of course right in, in many ways. I don't think, we can't say just abandon something and not say what to replace it with. So it's gonna, it's gonna be here for a while for many entities. The, the investors, of course, their money is at risk. Their, their decisions are tied up with the regulatory agency. And the regulatory agency is precedes the payer decisions because it has to be an approved therapy. So all these things are linked. I actually work at Blue Cross Blue Shield, their technology assessment uh, group that, that, that makes recommendations on technologies to adopt. And I would say both they and the FDA have sort of sliding scales in, in situations where you have complete safety and tremendous need and uh, you know, dire illness they're going to have different thresholds, just like the FDA has right now, where it's approving some therapies on the basis of virtually nothing um, in, in orphan drugs and some of the areas. And some people could disagree about how low the threshold sometimes goes. Um, I don't think we're going to ever educate the investor. I mean, I think what we we have the, the key leverage points. First of all, it has to be the community, but are the regulators to some extent, the editors, uh, but they'll never get too far away from the community itself. I mean, I think it's, it's a rising tide. I, I, the, the answer is not all through education because not all these groups can be educated and, and all the criteria are linked. And it may be that this, that this system that we have now with all the holes and leaks uh, needs to stay in place for many of these purposes for a while until we have a better comprehensive system to replace it if we ever have that. 
So that's why I think it might be premature to, to let it go right now when we don't really have alternatives, particularly for all these other stakeholders in the process. It, you'll, you could produce the chaos that Bob Temple was talking about. So I don't know what more to say about that, except you know, e each of the entities is constrained by the others, but is also changing as we speak within the latitude they have to change. And then certain, at a certain point, there's going to be uh, more clarity in the in the new criteria that, that we're going to be using. And it may be different in exploratory research and confirmatory research. We may have different standards for certain kinds of decision makers than other decision makers. Uh, I think e even now the, the illusion that we have consistent standard with significance is an illusion because it turns out to be dramatically different depending on many contexts. So we shouldn't carry that as the objective consistent standard. It's a rule. It's a rule like the two trial rule. But in many cases, it doesn't make any sense. So all I can say is it's a rule, but it doesn't always make sense. And the question is, can we move to things that make a little bit more sense while not giving up some of the value of having clear rules, which is, that is, uh, it's pretty much all they have now. But if you look at the variety, I actually have a project looking at exactly this at all the decisions that the FDA has made, and we're looking at every single one that went to advisory committees for the past five years, the, 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 the variation in the criteria that they are using right now is unbelievable. Variation is the rule. The only thing that I can say about that is that there are no rules for the variance that they make. So you can't predict exactly, it's everyone is ad hoc. There's no principle, and they will say this themselves. FDA itself can't make case law because they don't know exactly what all the divisions are doing and why they're doing it. So the, the rules are being broken all the time because the rules don't make perfect sense and they're trying to make accommodation for severity, for disease, for all the surrogate endpoints. I mean, they're doing this on a case by case basis. So we have the illusion that the FDA is, is driven by these rules, but they're not. And because we don't have a good alternative system, they're doing it on a completely ad hoc basis that they themselves say doesn't make perfect sense. I think Ron has something to say about um, the base factor. So not so much about the base factor, but just to follow on this question and this slide a little bit allows me to, to just make sure about something that gets conflated a little bit in today's discussion um, that I'd like to just be sure to clear up. So you didn't see anywhere on any of my slides or in any of the discussion about abandoning p-values. And I wanna make sure that that's clear. We're talking about whether we need to have statistical significance or not. Um, and I'm not going towards the, the, the chaos that may ensue from my recommendations or the, the sociological impact, which I, I think all of Steve's points are, are tremendously important. But uh, this is a really, really good slide and a really important one. And I'd like to call your attention to um, something that happens somewhere between evidence and action. And that is that at some point along this scale, um, something changes somewhere where things go from continuous to not continuous, where, where you can, where something, evidence is probably continuous and, and action at some point becomes more uh, able to be uh, thought of as being discrete or dichotomous. Um, and even some actions are, 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 are much more, uh, dis uh, have more nuances or flavors than just go or no go. Um, and so that's why we're not talking about um, abandoning p-values or other forms of evidence. Bayes factors, p-values contain all sorts of shades of evidence in them. Um, forcing them into significant or not significant loses all that flavor, just wipes all of that out. And that's, that's not what's talked about in the Nature article or in the larger McShane, et cetera, article, um, or in other articles in the, um, in the special issue of the American Statistician. That's not recommended in any uh, article in there. At, at no point is, uh, does, um, does a single of the 43 articles or the editorial recommend that p-values be thrown out. 
Thanks for the clarification, Ron. I just want to make one comment about Bayes factors. What I recommend is not Bayes factors writ large, because you're right, they're sensitive to price. It's the minimum Bayes factor or maximum, depending on how you. That is unique and is still better than a p-value. So it's, it's simply a different transformation of the same z-score they use the p-value for. I also like the minimum base factor too because this is simple and and it can be easily derived. There's another one I like. I, I can't quite, I think it's called the um, minimum, um, it's the one minus alpha or 95% of the um, the expected treatment effect. I think it's calculated based on the absorbed p-value and then um, comparing to a um, sort of a priori, uh, what is the um, considered clinically meaningful treatment effect. But, but my issue with these new measure is that it sort of not very subtly sort of raised the bar, right? If we, Steve, we looked at your um, slide, even with a P equal 0.03 is considered moderate um, evidence. So, you know, going back to what I said, you know, working in the industry, you know, working in a in an environment where the development cost is so high, patients are hard to find. More and more, we're working on niche products, so patients. But like, but I just want to say, the, yeah, they raised the bar, but a two rule, a two trial minimum significant 0.05 is already higher than 0.05. So it's really it's you could have a common agreement on what the net evidence should be. No one would almost ever agree that one trial of 0.05 would be enough. So the net evidence will probably still be the, the same. I, I, I don't know that it necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have the same rule if you had significance being equivalent to P of 0.01 or 0.005, that you had to have two trials with that degree of significance, you might have much more flexibility. So yes, it does raise the bar for one study. It doesn't necessarily raise the bar for what we collectively would decide is enough evidence to take some action. Hello, uh, my name is Bo Chen Jing, and I'm from, I'm a statistician from San Francisco VA as well as UCSF. Uh, my question, um, actually I've been frustrated with PLU today, driving down thinking about this topic. Um, you guys are talking about how to beat p-value, try to get the p-value under 0 0.05. My issue is I have a huge sample, and uh, when you run a model, everything is significant. Uh, Working with the VA, one thing we don't really care for is the sample size. We have 7 million veterans, right? And we are trying to build a model uh, for life expectancy prediction. We throw in 900 variables in. Uh, at the very beginning, we run a backward selection at a P is equal to 0 0.0001. And it didn't run. And then we cut the sample to 100,000. And it gave us under the P is equal to 0.0001, it gave us 130 variables. And then we restart this 1 million people with 900 variables in one. And this morning I got 296 variables. So uh, it, it really get me frustrated because I don't know what to believe. I'm the first one to raise my hand when he asked, Can we, are we going to abandon p-value? Because I think it probably is the time facing the big data and uh, you know, when you, your sample size is large enough, everything can be significant, especially today when I try to examine one, the variables from the, the large selection, diaper use jumped in to predict the, 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 the prediction of the mortality, which publish really get them. Publish it, publish it. <laughs> which get on my skin. So ultimate question is, um, facing the big data, how p-value adjusts itself. So maybe I can uh, say that. So to me, the, the point is that we should have the, the method that is appropriate to question. You know, big data, exploratory research, you know, really high sample size, p-values will not kind of help you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that in some situations, p-values and significant testing is helpful. So I'm saying don't throw it out altogether, just know when it is relevant. So I'm completely agreeing with you that it's not relevant in... Um, such large sample sizes and, and, and looking for kind of trends in data, in, in large data. Sounds like it's time for a lasso and valid internal validation. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna take one last question from the floor and we have another one online. 
Um, hello, my name is Hossein Eskarin. I am a postdoc at UCSF. Uh, my work is in statistical and computational genomics. Um, and the reproducibility crisis in science often pertains to molecular biology rather than epidemiology. And uh, like I have worked as in-house statistician informally for my lab and my department. The issue is in the design. Molecular biologists don't do any sort of statistical design, and there is not conformity to assumptions of the model checked power analysis that does not exist. Partly because it is community driven, they can publish the results the way they do things and they can get their grants the way they do things. So um, in that part for reproducibility crisis, p-value is a late point for the battle to start. Uh, I believe I want to know your ideas. It is uh, probably, um, effective to try to raise awareness about the importance of design in genomics. I understand it's very difficult because of the dimensionality of the data. It's not as simple as epidemiology, but that makes an interpretation of p-value or um, any proper statistical measure um, impossible, basically. Um, so uh, I want to know um, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Anyone, anyone want to take it? <laughs> I think, again, you know, the importance of what is the question, you know, what is the design you can use, and then what is the methodology, again, agreeing up front, okay, this is what you want to study, and then you see whether, you know, there is some better way to design it, and what is the right methodology for that. I think to me that is... Mm -hmm. And... Yes, and, and I understand this is, you know, a... Uh, pretty common problem in, in uh, many institutions that statisticians are not part of the design of the experiment or, or of the study. So I think, you know, I would just urge you to go talk with once they know you, hopefully next time they will involve you in the, in the um, design stage of the analysis, not, you know, you can tell them what the experiment died of, right? You can help them to uh, set it up in a better way. I want to put a plug in for meta research here. Sometimes the only, you say they can publish, they can get their grants. So obviously there's no pushback if, they, if they're wrong. So the only way to show, and this has been shown in genomic, as you know, with GWAS and many, many domains, is to do, you can do it, uh, is to do some meta research that follows up on these and shows how many of them are wrong. If they don't perceive there's a problem, there's no incentive for them to solve it. And if they can publish, there's no problem. The only problem is if somebody comes in and looks at all these kinds of experiments, as has been done with GWAS, and shows that there's virtually no rep replicability, that, that they're just producing noise. Every paper is noise. And if you can do that on a massive scale, on a, not even massive, on a medium scale, and, 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 and in a sense embarrass the field, then you have a platform to say, this is what we need to do. And that's what a lot of meta researchers do. They're they're really reformers in disguise. They're not just they're not just researching it to to, to publish significant findings. They actually want to show that there's not reproducibility, that almost all these findings are false or, or, or spurious, and that the solution is design X X X. And that's how these things get traction. I will say that <clears throat> said in other forms, the whole reason that we're here today is, I mean, people have been screaming about these things for a hundred years. The only reason that we've gotten real traction is because finally there's an acknowledgement that something is wrong in science and statistics is seen as part of that package. So there's finally a public, social, uh, highly visible acknowledgement that there's something wrong. So unless you can get these folks to you know, show them that there's something wrong, it, you're going to have a tough, it's always going to be a one by one thing and you're never going to win. So in the interest of time, let's go to, we have two questions uh, online uh, to the panelists. Um, so the first one is, what type of efforts are we making to change FDA requirements? Um, that person agreed there has been a lot of paper published on this and decades of discussion, but what type of research uh, approaches has been processed or will be in process? So basically it's about shaping the, um, you know, uh, mindset of FDA. Is there anything we want to proactively approach or not? Well, I'm involved in this only because I have a project with FDA that tries to, is, is, is focused on redefining the substantial evidence standard. They themselves are already doing this in 
both through in practice and they're issuing a guidance, I think in, in the next few months for comment on the, the greater flexibility they're gonna have in defining substantial evidence. It's also in the legislation, as I pointed out before. So there's a lot of activity going on in soul searching and, and study groups going on at FDA around real world evidence, as you know well, and about uh, evidentiary standards. Um, there's a lot more flexibility. So we can continue to publish methods related specifically aimed at FDA, like the one that was part of the collection, um, and, um, uh, you know, give workshops there. Uh, they're very interested in training, um, but they are moving. Uh, they are moving, pushed in part by legislation uh, that, that was generated by both uh, scientists and by patient groups who are very uh, upset about uh, the speed with which new, new uh, drugs or the criteria by which they were being judged. You, you deal with them all the time. Do you have any comments? My experience was FDA has been sort of mixed in the sense that sometimes it's very division specific. Some division, I found them to be more flexible. They're willing to look at the totality of data, you know, sort of accept the argument. And some were a little bit more sort of by the rule. Um, but nonetheless, that shouldn't stop us from trying, you know, put forward the argument. Uh, we have recently an example where we study three doses compared to placebo. And two of the doses that has a p-value about 0.1, the treatment effect is really nothing to write home about. Um, there's one dose where the uh, nominal p-value is 0.03. Um, after adjust for um, adjust for for the multiple comparison, it becomes 0.09. Um, but if you looked at it's a pearl, so the the primary endpoint is the total score of the pearl. And if you looked at the total score, you looked at subcomponents, you looked at the other um, Secondary endpoint, it all points that this is the dose. It seemed to be, you know, create, you know, generating a meaningful treatment difference compared to the comparator. But when we went to the FDA um, and said we would like to study this dose in phase three, the pushback was you haven't established statistical significance with this dose. However, they did say, you know, you carry the risk on your own, but we would not. You, you know, but, but we were able to basically convince them in a way it's the sponsor's risk and, and we, by using the totality of data, convince ourselves that, you know, this is the right dose um, to, to move forward in phase three. I think your point that FDA itself is not consistent, is, is a bunch of separate communities, is really important. I, I once once consulted on a trial because one group said, for some reason, the design is wrong. Go talk to Steve Goodman. So I consulted literally. That's, that's so they, they, they called me up. We designed a new trial. It was resubmitted to the FDA, but in the interim, it had moved from oncology to dermatology. Uh, and they rejected it completely and told them to do the first design that the oncology group had rejected. The oncology group, by the way, was right. They were totally right. The second room group was totally wrong. We went to have a meeting with them and we it was around a diagnostic and we talked about positive predictive value and things like this. They said they, they weren't literally, they told us, we're not interested in these newfangled things like positive predictive value. They never heard of that before. Uh, this, but this is just one group. And, and so they insisted we use sensitivity and specificity when it didn't actually make any sense. So FDA is highly, as you say, highly heterogeneous. It's hard to talk about FDA as, a, as a, some sort of single entity. Very nice, and I like your remark about the you know sensitivity versus uh, the positive predictive value, and I totally agree with what you just said. Um, so we have one last question from online. I think this is from uh, Professor Jia Yang Sun, and I think she sent in a earlier email to Ron um, about um, you know what do you think as a complementary measure of evidence to the p value. So I I, I think. Uh, Dr. Sun was asking, you know, whether there's any kind of consensus on complementary measures, and 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 there really isn't yet, um, as as was heard from from today. So I appreciate that that question from her it would it would make all of our lives so easy if if there was. I just I just think that if if, if there was going to be one that we uh, were going to settle on, we'd have found it already. So um, there, there's just not a community consensus on something like that yet. 
Right. Um, and we already over time, and I appreciate um, all of our panelists. I would like to give you, you know, just one last, um, you know, sent key takeaway to the audience, to online and in-person audience. What would you say to them? Um, I'd like to start with Ron, please. I just like to say that I, I think we, we know what doesn't work at this point. We, we know that continuing to um, do things the way that we have done them for many decades or what I was reminded of by Dr. Goodman tonight, many, many centuries, we, we know what doesn't work. And so um, might be time to um, do something different. I would say don't underestimate the power of doing things right in one, one's own community, just like states can be laboratories for the nation. If one community, well, you know, pediatric oncology or, uh, you know, or economics or whatever starts to do things in a way that really makes sense and shows that it's workable, this will be a model for others. So every one of us has a certain sphere of influence um, and don't underestimate the, the potential impact of doing something right within your sphere of influence and, and, and getting things published and then, you know, tweet it out and then other people will pick it up and uh, it will serve as, it, 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 these ripples go outward and the, the ground is now, you know, much more fertile than it was before and these seeds will grow. So that everybody here has a role to play in perpetuating this, uh, in, in moving us in a more sensible direction. I want to echo what Steve said. We as a statistician, we know when it's appropriate to use p-value, when, you know, to look beyond the, the, the single value of a p-value, and especially with the special issue by ASA and then the commentary in nature, uh, there's a win in our sale that uh, we should continue to work and lead the movement, educate our colleagues, our collaborators on how to appropriately interpret the results. To me, again, it's embracing that uncertainty, understanding the context, and think about new ways. You know, what could be appropriate for a different context? You know, what could be better and different statistical analysis methods that would move us forward? And, you know, use statistical significance in the few, very few cases when actually in, in a conformatory studies, when right now we don't necessarily have a better alternative for it. Very inspiring, and thank you so much for all of you, and hopefully we all learned something today, right? And uh, I think, you know, I want to reiterate what I mentioned in the beginning, that this is a community that we all building together, and the movement needs all of us. So let's work together. Thank you so much for all the panelists. Thank you so much for all of you for participation, for online, and also Andre for the wonderful IT support. Thank you so much.